Tonight I welcome you on behalf of the Adelaide City Mission and with the support of the South Australian National Football League, we are proud to, to present the Great Grand Finals Night. We're celebrating tonight a great era, certainly an era of great characters and of two great football teams. May I remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that all the monies raised from tonight's function goes towards the youth programs operated by the Adelaide City Mission. And disadvantaged young people from uh, throughout uh, the city of Adelaide will be benefiting from your uh, participation in tonight. Now, ladies and gentlemen, to our special guest for tonight. Port Adelaide has always been the team to beat. A team loved and hated, depending on your allegiance. But there's not one of us that do not admire the Port Adelaide Football Club. In their history, the Port Adelaide Club have won an amazing 30 premierships. And in the course of their history, they have only been out of the major round on nine occasions. In 1965, in winning the flag, it was the 10th time in 15 years. Ladies and gentlemen, with the great assistance of ANSET Australia and led by its captain, Jeff Motley, Please welcome the players who represented in the 1965 and 1966 Grand Finals, Port Adelaide. trouble here with uh, team placings, but they'll be right in a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, please give them a special welcome, will you? The opposition tonight is the Sturt Football Club, and for Sturt 1965, it had been a long time between drinks. A premiership in 1940, and then a desert, and many lowly positions until the mid-60s. Mid 25 years of waiting. And then came Jack Oatey and the commencement of a golden era for the Sturt Football Club. Again, ladies and gentlemen, with the kindness of ANSET Australia, would you welcome with its captain John Halbert the 1965 and 1966 grand final sides of the Sturt Football Club. The work of the Adelaide City Mission highlights, highlights differences within our society of the privileged and the underprivileged, of the haves and the have-nots, of those with plenty and those with little. We believe therefore that it's appropriate tonight that we commence our evening by acknowledging our opportunities, our privileges and the superb dinner soon to be served by the catering staff of the SANFL. Pastor Brian Schwarz of the Lutheran Church played 88 games, mainly on the halfback flank with Sturt over a five year period, and we've asked him tonight to uh, lead us in a blessing for tonight's activities. Ladies and gentlemen, will you uh, pause for a moment with me as uh, 
we ask the best and fairest to uh, bless our meal. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to, to meet with old friends and old foes and to remember the, the great days and the good days. Bless us as we share this meal together and uh, give us a heart for those for whom the game of life is still hard. In Jesus' name. So ladies and gentlemen, we turn to football 1965. At the end of the minor round, the top four stood as Port Adelaide with 34 points, South Adelaide with 30, Sturt with 26 and Norwood with 26. In the first semi-final, Sturt ran out close winners against Norwood, 15-21 to 6-21. In the second semi, Port Adelaide, through Peter Mead kicking a goal in the last five seconds, defeated South 17-10 to 1611 and Steve Trainer was best on ground that day. In a bruising and exciting preliminary final, Sturt 14-10 defeated South 12-15 by seven points. Peter Daly, do you remember that game? No, he doesn't. <laughs> and so to the grand final, October the 2nd, 1965. 5KA, 5AU, 5RM. The time is 2 o'clock. Welcome to Woodruff's Football Broadcast with your commentators Tom Warhurst, Max Hall and Roger Dowsett. Today's match, the 1965 Grand Final... We have with us tonight as our very special guests and our commentators, Tom Warhurst, Max Hall, and in the place of Roger Dowsett, Gordon Schwartz. Would you please welcome these gentlemen? A record crowd of more than 62,000 at Adelaide Oval for South Australia's League Football Grand Final. McGarry medal winner, Central District strong marking half forward, Gary Window, receives his award prior to the big match. Last season's medal winner, Jeff Motley, leads Port Adelaide nine times premiers in the past 14 years. Their opponents, Sturt, led by John Halbert, are in their first grand final in 24 years. Last winning the premiership in 1940, Sturt qualified for today's big one with a seven points victory over South in the preliminary final. Umpire Ken Cunningham bounces the ball in perfect weather. Kicking towards the southern end, Porter first into attack. It's tight scrambling play in the opening minutes. Snapping from a pack, Freeman opens scoring with a behind. The more experienced Magpies are trying to unsettle their opponents to set up a good early lead. And in the first five minutes, prevents Sturt taking the ball forward of centre. John Carl's punt covers good distance and is beautifully marked by Eric Freeman. A chance for Freeman, who kicked six goals in his first state game, but it's offline for a behind. Going forward, the double blues are settling down, testing the famed defense of their rivals. Peter Thomas kicks to Rigney. A good mark spells danger for the Magpies. Rigney drives the ball in for Mal Jones to mark, and his kick is on target for the first goal of the match. Sturt, after a hard struggle to make the grand final, hit the front. With an easing of nervous tension, the pace quickens. Paul Bagshaw pulls one down in front of Bob Philp as Sturt attempt to open up play. Hoping to emulate his father, Hartley, who was a member of Sturt's 1940 premiership side, Bagshaw kicks to Dunn as the Blues maintain the initiative. The younger Sturt combination is developing teamwork as they rapidly gain confidence. Undaunted by Port's aggressive style, Sturt counter effectively, creating opportunities. Their smallest player, Roger Rigney, dashes in to score the Blues' second major. Port 
Fort wins the knockout, but centre man Carl's kick is pulled down by the reliable Brenton Adcock. Adcock, who made the state side for the first time this season, has his kick taken in spectacular fashion by flying Ron Ellaway. Ellaway at six for three and a half is Port's tallest player, and his punt is well directed, putting maximum pressure on Sturt's defence. 19 year old Reg Beaufoy sends the ball through the centre for the first of Port's three goals of the quarter. Roving courageously, Rigney gains Sturt the initiative. Graham Cooper attempts to break down the attack but is penalised for pushing Halbert in the back. Many times a state representative and 1961 McGarry medal winner, Halbert kicks and at full arm stretch, Tony Clarkson saves a mark, then passes to Hicks. In the closing stages of the first quarter, Sturt trail by nine points. Darrell Hicks is offline for a behind and Port lead three goals three to two goals one at the changeover. Rick Scoff drives Sturt straight into attack. The Blues' constructive play is a strong challenge to hard tackling Port. Sturt continually strive to open up play. A chance for Adcock. It's wide for a behind, but Sturt are lifting the tempo of their game. Malcolm Hill palms the ball out perfectly to Dunn to give him a chance. An accurate snap. And Sturt's third goal as the Blues close on the Magpies' lead. From the throw-in, Scoff gains possession as Sturt charge forward. Their attack is jolted by 30-year-old Motley's great mark. Motley's kick is brought down by opposing vice-captain Terry Short as the fortunes of the game alternate in exciting fashion. Short kicks to Hicks, but he's beaten by Bruce Nyland. The defensive measures of both teams frustrate their rivals in a seesaw battle. A remarkable diving mark by Bob Fabian saves Port from a threatening situation. Jeff Potter, the Magpies tireless rover, handles well, but his kick is pulled down by six-footer John Tilbrook. Tilbrook, one of the year's best recruits, kicks to Jones. Jones, in great form, holds a screamer to give Sturt a golden opportunity. Through the centre for Jones' second goal, taking Sturt within a point of the Magpies. Renowned for their steadiness under pressure, Port strikes back a few seconds later. Vice-captain Carl, consistently winning at centre, kicks to Peter Mead, who takes the mark. It's through for a goal from point-blank range. Port again as Philp goals, and the Magpies add two majors inside a minute. Fabian, veteran of the side at 31, has his kick taken with a thrilling fingertip mark by Clarkson. The tallest player on the field, the six foot four Clarkson uses his height to its fullest advantage. Albert shepherding well allows Thomas to go as the Blues storm back into the game. Snapping up a misdirected port pass, Clarkson sparks another Sturt raid. Taking the ball at centre wing, Roger Dunn flashes in at top pace. His shot is true, the ball flying through the centre for a goal. At half-time, Sturt are within a point of their rivals. Port leading 6-3, 39 points to 6-2, 38. Port supporters are not unduly perturbed by the close scores. The Magpies have often proved their mettle under similar circumstances, having won the 1958 Premiership by two points and on two other occasions by a margin of three. 
Sturt have scoffed back at centre and Tilbrook on the opposite half-forward flank at the start of the third quarter. Port move into attack with Motley adding thrust before being grounded by Tilbrook. It's hard scrambling play in the early stages as harassing defence prevents safe handling. Port breaks away and Meade races in to score a comfortable goal. Driving his team to greater effort, Jeff Motley sets a fine example. Almost impassable at half-back, he looms as a major threat to Sturt's premiership hopes. The ever-alert Port Rovers are also providing problems for the Blues. Potter's kick drifts across the goal face and out of bounds. A big let-off for Sturt. From the throw-in, Sturt gains possession and clears, but they lack cohesion and Port are beating them to the ball. But they're defending well. Port swings Beaufoy to centre-half forward and Freeman to full forward in an effort to penetrate. Striving desperately to lift their game, Sturt appear rattled and rush their play. John Murphy gets a free and Sturt has a chance to ease the pressure. The Blues need another big effort like the one that took them back into the final four with victories over Norwood and South shortly before the major round. But Port, in command, take the ball away. Freeman guides the ball through. Port go to a 22 points lead. Sturt swing Halbert to centre, Tilbrook to centre half forward and Scoff to half forward flank to strengthen the line. But there's no holding Port. They're in again as Potter snaps another. Sturt grimly hang on, hoping to hit their stride again. In the closing minutes, Dunn gets through to goal for Sturt's only points of the turn. At three-quarter time, Port has a 29 points advantage. For the final quarter, Sturt replace injured Rigney with Wicker, who goes onto a wing with Hicks roving. Halbert is back at centre half forward, Short at centre, Thomas at half back. Port attack with Freeman marking strongly in the second minute of play. From an acute angle, his kick is on target for a goal. Sturt trail by 35 points. They're in real trouble, but far from beaten. With renewed vigour, they surge forward into Port's hard defence. Jones marks for a sharply angled chance, and the Blues, who came from a 16-point deficit in the last quarter of the preliminary final, are poised for another dramatic fight back. Jones' kick sends them on their way. Throwing everything into the game, Sturt flow goalwards again. Breaking through the defence in the stand pocket, Jones steadies and with a magnificent running angle shot, steers the ball through. Sturt are within 19 points of court and they're back in the match. Sturt's changes are effective and improved backing up prevents their opponents taking advantage of any errors. Finding it hard to penetrate, Port are not the same confident combination of the third quarter. Sturt drives forward and Clarkson has a chance but his shot hits the post for a behind. Elloway kicks to Dave Gill, who takes a safe mark. Port clears the danger area to drive the ball goalwards. Within a yard of the line, Kevin Salmon is wide for a behind, and Porter feeling the pressure of Sturt's sustained aggression. Sturt replaced Scoff with Jones and Port Mead with Matters. A great pass finds Emmy Jones and it's another goal as Sturt closed the gap to 15 points with about six minutes playing time left. It takes
tagging the trend of play. Sturt snare the ball away from the Magpies. Clark sends them into attack with Court dashing back in desperate defence. The Blues combine efficiently as Clark finds Adcock, who marks within kicking range. There's tension on and off the field. Adcock miss kicks. The ball flying off the side of his boot, out of bounds. Oh, I can't stand much more of this. Another chance. From about 50 yards out, Tilbrook has a shot. It's through the centre, and the crowd goes wild as Sturt are now only nine points behind. With their direct approach and sureness in the air, Sturt through Jones are well positioned for another shot. Drop punt and Jones steers it through for his sixth goal. Just three points the difference with seconds remaining. Port tighten their defence to stem the onrushing Blues. But there's the Hooter. Port take their tenth premiership in 15 years, 12-8-80 to 12-5-77 and a cliffhanger finish. Court and state coach Foster Williams is chaired across the field by his players to mark the end of the greatest season in the state's football history. The first time more than a million spectators have attended league games in South Australia. As you can see, I'm looking better now than I've looked for a long, long time. Maybe I've got a uh, hotel might have helped me a bit. What part has football played in your life? What part? I think it's played a, a big part. I've made a lot of friends. Not, not a lot of enemies, but a, a lot of mates in it. I think it's a great thing that uh, I enjoyed my football and, and I made a lot of friends out of it. Terrific. 133 games in 11 seasons means you played about uh, 12 games a year. Did you spend a lot of time in the seconds, Bob, or...? Uh... <laughs> Were you injury prone? I played 99 games in the seconds. And I, I look in the paper every Friday. Now, I'll get that 100th one yet. It's <laughs> only a matter of time. Terrific. And just, just while I'm making these passing comments about your career, I noticed from the statistics that are uh, in the budget there that you played one state game. Now, somebody mentioned that Victoria begged you not to play again. Other people suggested other things rather less flattering. Can you just tell us a little bit about that game, Bob? Well, that, that starts a little story, but before I get onto that story, as you can see, I've got my glass on, because I want to read it, some stats. And I looked in 1965 grand final, there was, we had 10 handballs. <laughs> right. Now, is, is um, I don't think Bobby Fabian's here, is he? No, he's not. No, you know why? He had three handballs, and the coach <laughs> is still on him about that. <laughs> How can you have three handballs in a grand final? Yeah. There's got to be something wrong somewhere. <laughs> and he's still, he's still hiding. Yeah. I got in the state side, you know. And my dad left at three quarter time, so he missed my kick. <laughs> I had it in the I had it in the 72nd minute of the game. I was a bit I was lucky that day that John Nichols, Dietrich. Schultz, another bloke that uh, played for Geelong, I can't remember his name, Farmer. You know, I had a top day out, really. You know, all I seen was these big V's, the numbers. Oh. So it was a nightmare. And, I, and, I, and Dad left at three quarter time, so I missed my kick. I had one kick. Oh, John Carl, of course, he didn't make one. He'll tell you about that later on. But the best part about it is, I'm, I'd made the states, so I thought, right, you know. I'm sick of getting this £10 a week, $20 I was getting as a player. I was going to get in for 11 quid. <laughs> so I walked in and, I, and he said, sit down. And Zoe walked over to close the doors and he turned around and he said to Zoe, don't worry about it, he won't be here too bloody long. <laughs> and that's the big fella. And he, <laughs> And he had one way of cutting it apart, and that was it. But he looked after Port Adelaide, which was the main thing. Thanks very much. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> what other players particularly had an influence on your uh, football in your early uh, part of your career with Sturt? Well, Tony Goodchild lived at Taylor Bend. He was a pig farmer at Taylor Bend. 
and he took me to, to the city on a Saturday morning and he taught me that at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning you had to have a steak and chips at the Shell Roadhouse at Murray Bridge if you wanted to play well. <laughs> but I do recall the first time I ever went to training at Sturt, I was 16 and I was scared out of my wits and that player, Tony Goodchild, said to me during training, I was with all these old guys, you know, Wally May and uh, John Halbert. And, <laughs> and he, he came across and he said, son, you've got a good drop kick. Now that's about uh, 35 years ago and I remember it distinctly. I suppose that's a coach or a player positively reinforcing good play. The toughest opponent you faced? There's a few here, Erie and Nyland, and there was Brucey e. Light. That guy, Bob Philp, broke my jaw at Unley Oval on one occasion. <laughs> Bruce Light broke my arm and put me, in put me in hospital on two occasions for knee operations. <laughs> Just walk back down this way when you go, Darrell. <laughs> As a, uh, a commentator as well, Daryl, you're often uh, obviously asked, what's the, what's the big difference looking back on the mid-60s as against the uh, early 90s? What's something that particularly stands out in your mind as the difference between football in those, over those 27 years? Well, certainly the value, thinking back on what Bob said, when Sturt won their fifth premiership in a row in 1970, Ray Kutcher will remember this, my cheque group certificate showed that we earned eight dollars a game. I think it's the most exciting time in the history of the game nationally but we are in fear of losing the grassroots where it all begins. A couple of good opponents that you uh, stood in your career, Ron. Actually the whole damn lot of them really. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's hard, I guess it's hard to say. Uh, everybody's out there to do the job for each team. Um, they wouldn't have been there otherwise. I guess in the era that we're talking about now, in the mid-60s uh, onwards, you'd have to say the Sturt forwards. Um, for the way the ball was, well, the way they worked the ball right through the ground at that stage. Uh, I suppose Emmy Jones, well, I'll take that five bucks off you later, Emmy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I'd say uh, at, at that stage, yeah. Uh, probably Emmy and a few of those guys. Ron, can you remember one game in your career that gave you the greatest amount of satisfaction? Yeah, probably the first uh, first game, first league game. Yeah, like I'm in there, I've got one up. Yeah. <laughs> against uh, who? That's against Torrance at uh, Thebby Oval. I stood Jeff Kingston that day. I was going for these drop kicks uh, that weren't getting off the ground. Poor little thing. The thing was, Jeff was standing about 10 yards away and I seemed to go in over end, just hit before him go over his head. Like, Kurt was at centre half back, Kurt's picking the ball up and he's clearing it. But uh, yeah, it was one of those games. Like, kickouts weren't that flash, but still, we won. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I got dropped the next Saturday to reserve. <laughs> Can you learn how to kick? Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one of the best drop kicks the uh, South Australian footballers produced, Mr. Ron Elloway. Why did you only play for four years? Did you have a uh, financial problem too, like the other side? Um, no, it was a similar story though. Uh, I did play uh, one state game, and I think I got about the same number of kicks as Philby got, uh, and we got walloped. Um, and in the same time, I was a little bit worse off than, uh, than Bob. But, uh, uh, I finished up with a knee injury and broken leg and all sorts of things, and uh, that was the end of uh, end of my career. So uh, you, even if you only played one, Bob, you got through it. <laughs> Following that, I, uh, in the three or four years after that, um, I did a bit of coaching at the, uh, at the junior level. And uh, I must say that uh, I don't think I was the world's best coach. Um, and then uh, I left the game for some years, and uh, I think it was about 1987, I came back and was chairman of selectors for Sturt. Uh, and there again, we weren't too, uh, too successful, finishing uh, um, I think it was fifth, ninth, bottom, bottom in those four years, so I thought that was time to give that away as well. <laughs> Have you done anything positive since you stopped playing? <laughs> Not a lot in the football side, Sturt seemed to have a different method of coming into attack. Can you, uh, now after all these years and the veils of secrecy be pulled aside, can you remember 
a game plan that you may have had in uh, in working in the forward area? Oh, I don't think it's uh, it's all that uh, that secret. I think the, uh, the pattern of Sturt uh, play in those days and uh, in the years that uh, follow are pretty well uh, pretty well documented. Um, but certainly the uh, uh, the forward lines were uh, were kept pretty open, and uh, I really uh, I suppose the uh, the way the ball came in with the skill of the people in, in front of me who could uh, uh, who could kick, and all I had to do was uh, uh, run to a spot and uh, hopefully be in front of the full back and it would, uh, would be in my hands. And uh, that was uh, probably the way that I got, uh, got most of my goals. So I don't think it's too much to say. Rick, you played a uh, number of games with uh, a number of positions with Sturt over the years. Uh, I can remember you playing centre-half back, centre and centre-half forward. Which of the positions did you prefer? <sighs> Thanks, Rick. <laughs> I think he's going to say something more here. It's been a long flight in today. I'm, I'm just trying to think of the normal cliche. Oh, look, I'll play wherever the team wants me. That's absolutely beautiful, Rick. Rick, we actually owe you an apology tonight because in the budget you will see that uh, under your statistics you did not play a state game which is not a bad achievement because in 1966 I think you were an All-Australian player, is that right? So I'm going to have to blame the uh, Sturt statisticians here for this information, but uh, how, many Sturt, how many state games did you play? Well, I, does anyone else know? Because if they don't, um, 73. <laughs> What was the best game you played for South Australia? Um, well, they were all, all extremely good. <laughs> I, I, I honestly, being serious for a minute, I, I think the first one I played was the most memorable. Um, Can you remember who it was against? Victoria. <laughs> They had a very, very dark blue jumper with a white V on it. Uh, I never saw the fronts of the jumper. Rick, there's no uh, question that the Sturt team of the middle and later 60s was a magnificent sight. Why was it such a good football team? Well, I, I don't think there's any doubt about that, and uh, because of Odin. Um, I think he treated us all as individuals, which we definitely were. Some liked to train, some didn't. <laughs> some could kick, some couldn't. But uh, there was a place for all of us. It was a very happy family, and, and genuinely, I think, Oti, and, and behind Oti, of course, the, the management of the time, and everyone around the club. Um, it was just a great club to work in at that time. Rick, what was the funniest thing that happened to you on the football field? On the football field? <laughs> on the football field. Um, I, I don't think anything funny happens on the football field. But, um, well, let's try it half time. Or... Did anybody ever say anything funny? Or was it well, just one big happy family? Well, I, I think a, a bittersweet funniness, um, and I, I think a lot of people out here tonight ought to apologise to me tonight, because uh, the 66 grand final, which we're going to show later on, um, I was ruled injured, um, and on the Saturday morning I woke up and I was as fit as a scrub ball. <laughs> Oti, I was fit. <laughs> um, at any rate, the doorbell rang and uh, I went to it and there, were, there was a telex there and uh, I was delighted. I knew some fans were interested in, in uh, the fact that I was ill. So I read this telex and I would 
love to know who sent it because it said, we are desperately sorry to see that you're still injured. We were praying that you would play today. And it was signed by the Port Adelaide Cheer Squad. <laughs> Look back over 11 years with uh, Port Adelaide. Brian, what's what's Bruce? Bruce, Bruce, and Bruce, and Bruce Brian. Brian, he was up here before. Right. Oh, your brother Brian. Bruce. Uh, That's Dean. Dean, I've got a brother Dean. And uh, it's lovely to have you with us tonight. I'm sorry he can't be here as well. <laughs> He's in jail. <laughs> Are there any questions you'd like to ask me, Bruce? <laughs> Are you gay? <laughs> I mean, happy. I mean, I wonder if we could have idea was just to get me up here. <laughs> I wonder if we could have another prayer at this stage. <laughs> Saturday morning arrives and um, I thought, well, uh, I've got to play, uh, where? Because uh, I, I had some bad habits. One was not read the paper, you know. <laughs> so maybe I'm in the A's, the B's, you know, this week I'm in the A grade, you know. So I was in the A's. And, uh, but I didn't know where, right? <laughs> so I rushed out, I got my gear. Ross Hasman knows his story backwards. Maybe he should tell it. <laughs> That's not funny. So I get down and I've got my gear and there's no bloody cars there. So I look around and there's kids playing, right? I'm only going to sit around myself, you know. There's kids playing, I think, I'm not the cops anymore, I mean, I think I'm playing the over it. So, no, I can't ask an old bloke, I said, we're a poor boy. <laughs> so he said, they're playing at Norwood. So I rush out of Norwood, I get out there and I get. And Foster, by this time, I can do it. It's unprintable. <laughs> anyway, so I was a bolt, you know. <laughs> he wanted to kill me. And he had a reason to do that. I'm going on, I know. Uh, anyway, I, I get changed. I'm, do, I'm happy now. I'm changed. It's two, I know it's 2 o'clock. We've got 10 minutes, right? So I'm listening to the speech. And he gets to me. And he looks at me and he says, oh, I, I, I don't mean this in... in um, he says, Jesus, oh. <laughs> and um, I said, what's wrong? What? I'm late, you know, I'd flat away. You know? <laughs> and he said, uh, look around it. And I looked around, you know, and I said, yep. Port Adelaide, that's me. <laughs> and, I, and he says, uh, look again. So I looked. I look down the line of all these maniacs that I'm playing with, you know, Graham Cooper and people like this, you know, maniac guys like this, you know, gonna kill people, feel big, you know. And uh, I'm the only one sitting there in black shorts. Well, if you, if you could make the grand final in any year, if you get selected in it, it's a magnificent honour. And um, I thought 66 was here, 65 was very disappointing. 66, I think all the boys knew that they were going to win it. And um, 67 was the better one, I thought. <laughs> Come back next year, folks. <laughs> Roger. Uh, with your, with the two of you roving together, did any one of you uh, hog the ball more than the other? We had to always get wrinkles off the ball and stayed there all day. Well, you played 210 games with uh, Sturt. The first question I've got to ask you, is it true that you taught Bob Shearman how to kick? Yeah, well, uh, Bob and I used to get around together at the Unley Oval and uh, I'll say, look here, Bob, this is the way to do a semi-hard drop kick. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what was your first game with Sturt? Where was it? Who did you play against? Uh, it was back in oh, 1959 when I first started with Sturt. Uh, I can't remember. It was, I think it might have been against uh, the Bays. And 
No, well, then I'll forget to. Well, but anyway, my third game was against the base, and my third game I got reported, and I got three matches from next test. <laughs> Uh, Max didn't believe me, and I, I, he wouldn't believe me, and um, he said to me, Max said to me in the hallway up, he said, it was me, right? He said, I was all right, he said, but those other two buggers didn't. Was <laughs> <laughs> you uh, also kicked a lot of goals for Sturt. What was the, what was the greatest number of goals you kicked in one game? Uh, well, the match, really. Uh, I think I got about five in one game. Uh, that's about me. I had five or six, and but it's been... Uh, over, over those years, and that have been fantastic uh, with the Stuart Football Club and the people that you've met around. Uh, I look across over here, I see Neil Curley there and Ken Cunningham and up to all these great people that you meet through your football career, and it has been terrific. You've allocated me miserable three minutes to cover a career that was worth three and a half hours. <laughs> And you've, you've given me the same amount of time as what Foss Williams expected me to cover three laps in the upper neighbourhood. <laughs> actually, uh, actually, to be honest, Dave, you've now got less time than everybody else. Well, I'm, I'm pleased about that because uh, anything I tell you could be subject to libel. Uh, however, I, I yeah. remember what the first question was, Dave. What happened in so 1961? Uh, the same thing as what happened in 1960, actually. Uh, Jeff Motley wouldn't allow me to play on the wing because he suggested I was too quick to take handballs from these other blokes. So I, uh, I had a touch of Bob Filt fever and I got sick of 10 pound a Saturday too so I went across to Yorktown and they paid me 15. <laughs> Plus a side of meat a week and a rent free home. <laughs> I, I was probably one of the early professionals. Dave, you, uh, you played for Sydney you mentioned you wanted to play on the wing. What positions did you play for Ford in your career? Everywhere except the centre wing where I wanted to play. <laughs> but, uh, I was one of the fortunate ones that uh, if there was a bit of a problem at any stage, well, it was always send Gilly in because we've always got him to blame at the end of the game. <laughs> uh, if somebody was out injured, well, I always got lucky that at least I knew I was in consideration because I could play there. Uh, Foss was only lucky that I didn't do a Billy Thomas and take over the Raven role. <laughs> Dave, uh, what are you doing in Alice Springs? As little as possible, but I work for the government. <laughs> <laughs> I did go to work one day, but they wouldn't let me. <laughs> of the matter is I work with correctional services. I think it was either being it one way or the other. <laughs> I leave my uniform fits. <laughs> Do any of, the, any of the clients that you work with in the course of the week remind you of any of your former opponents? Most. <laughs> I think Actually, uh, it, did, it did actually surprise me. I started a correctional service career because when I left uh, the beloved Port Adelaide, I spent 21 wonderful years in Mount Gambia. And uh, that's where I got my start in correctional services and many people was, weren't surprised when I said I'm in jail. <laughs> but uh, the, the, the thing was that uh, it surprised me most that after I'd served 10 years in Mount Gambia in the service, I still hadn't locked up an up for and I still don't know why. <laughs> but uh, as, as for opponents, no, we were, we were all pretty well tarred with the same brush and uh, I've been accused of doing a lot of funny things. Uh, umpires even accused me. They always knew how to spell my name on a report sheet, but never on the McGarry Middle paper. <laughs> uh, that, that was another thing that intrigued. G-I-L-L. The eye, you did it on report sheets. Uh, however, no, uh, I don't think I really made an enemy amongst the opposition. If I did, they'd be too frightened to come forward. Dave, uh, somebody reminded me uh, in the pre dinner drinks area that uh, quite a number of people's noses collided with you over the course of your career. Is this true? Yes, yeah, well, I was accused of breaking 14 noses. Uh, and I looked at a bloke the night and said, well, I didn't stand him, obviously, he was as straight as a guy. <laughs> but the one 
thing I'm proud of, I've broken noses and that means no king hits. They saw it coming, therefore they were too strong. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure now to welcome one of our guests of honour to the platform. The budget that you have in front of you certainly uh, outlines the shape that he uh, made of South Australian football after the war. He was one of the greatest rovers, he was one of the greatest coaches. With the acclaim he deserves, would you please welcome Mr Foster Williams. the applause you've received uh, displays uh, the people's feeling towards you. Foss, how do you uh, how do you feel watching that video again tonight? Can you remember the 65 grand final? I, I, I can remember it quite plainly and uh, I, well, I think I was uh, probably uh, less emotional on those times but I don't think I got uh, uh, Ray and my, my emotions were you know, raised by the fact that Sturt were making a the final approaches and uh, worrying us towards the end of the game. And uh, as I see myself being carried off, it was uh, you know, quite encouraging to see the thing all over again. Yeah. Foss, uh, was there ever a grand final in which you did get emotional? <laughs> uh, I suppose so, but I think like, if, if you get emotional, you lose contact with the game and you lose the direction that you might you should be taking and uh, I think uh, keeping your senses at the time it means that uh, you make the right move at the right time if there are moves to be made. Well, Foss, uh, I can remember as a teenager reading a book that was printed which was a fairly controversial book called The Gap. It was uh, not acclaimed by all parents as the ideal reading for uh, young people but in that book, I recall the story of a young bloke who came to disaster uh, uh, on one event. Can you recall the uh, situation and what happened to Foss Williams? Well, I remember The Gap. That was a, a book, uh, I think, written with the idea of uh, getting more control over juniors during the 19, late 50s and early 60s. I think this is the way it went. And uh, yes, I can remember the embarrassing moments that I experienced as a 10-year-old, I think I was at the time. And, uh, 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 you know, going back, the story goes along with these lines that uh, I disobeyed my parents and went swimming as a ten-year-old. And uh, my father came down to the swimming pool, which is about two, uh, two miles away from the town of Corn, and uh, <coughs> was looking for me. And of course, as he approached, everybody told me he was coming, so I hid behind a tree. And hiding behind a tree, he couldn't find me but he could find my clothes, so he grabbed all my clothes and took them home. <laughs> so here I am left with half a towel uh, to get home. And uh, when I arrived home, he asked me, and I was 10, and Dad would have been uh, probably 50 at that time, and I think our running speed was approximately the same. <laughs> so he took after me, and I was keeping the two guys in front, just in front of him all the way, and I think all corn heard me at the time saying, don't, Dad, don't. You know, he was going to smack me one way or the other. And the, the final outcome was that I think I learned my lesson. At the same time, Dad was too puffed to do anything about building me. So that's, that's the end of the story. <laughs> I can recall as a youngster only seeing you play football a couple of times and obviously it was right at the end of your career. How would you describe yourself as a footballer? That last time I was best on ground, remember? <laughs> <laughs> the problem was I couldn't see over the pickets. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, uh, no, we come from a real sporting family. The whole family of five boys and a, a girl. Uh, you know, we all played football at the highest level and my father was a champion in the north at the time and there wasn't that sort of uh, scramble as there is now to bring players to the city. But he played his games up around the corner in Port Augusta at that time and probably one of the things that come out of, uh, you know, the discussions of the Williamses is that 
that they pay me as a tribute of being as equal to my father. So that's what I have to live with, really. Boss, you've uh, influenced an enormous number of people in your playing and coaching days. How has football influenced Boss Williams? Well, I think, you know, I'm talking about the whole family. I think it's, you know, it's been, you know, part of our, our life as far as football goes. You go through a career of playing, then you go through a career of coaching, and then to coincide with your cutting off of coaching and my retirement, our sons, uh, you know, came into the game and, and they, uh, I've filled in the period since then, so our whole life has been revolving around football. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, we've enjoyed the whole thing, seen uh, wonderfully well, and uh, uh, we hope to see it come to the end, really. Foss, my final question to you is, uh, how good was Sturt, the Sturt of the late 60s and uh, under Jack Oatey? Oh, well, they were, you know, they proved it against us, so I think the first three uh, combats against them in grand finals immediately after the 65, that means the 66, 68. Uh, they were too good. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, our uh, uh, personnel might have declined slightly after our, our uh, uh, golden periods of the, uh, the late 50s and things like that. But uh, they were a very good team. And uh, if you're going to say how uh, we would have competed against them at our top, I think we would have won. <laughs> what about a rematch at some stage, boss? Is there any chance of that? Well, the only time you could play would probably be by computer. Foss, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's been a uh, great honour for me to welcome you here to the uh, podium tonight. And I think that uh, there's not a person here who wouldn't want me to acknowledge to you the contribution that you have made to, uh, to South Australian football. It's been an honour to have you as one of our special guests tonight. We could talk for a long time. But ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to show in uh, your own way your uh, tribute to Foster Williams. Uh, as a medico, a question that a lot of people uh, ask as uh, careers and people get a little bit older and joints start to stiffen up or have to get replaced, I suppose the big question is with the uh, pressure on the body, is it all worth it? Oh, undoubtedly, Roger, I think. Uh, I can't imagine you asking any of the players that have played football here tonight, and that includes not only the Ports and the Sturt players that play, but with several others I've seen around the place, whether it's worthwhile, and I'll all say yes. Um, I see my erstwhile coach in front of me with a spare heart and a spare, two spare hips and a spare knee, and he needs a new spare brain. He has done for some time. And he'd still say it was worthwhile. There's no question. Uh, I think if you ask uh, all of the Sturt team who I know very well, uh, what they've gained from the game by playing the game of football and they'd say it was worthwhile. In my own personal uh, experience, I know that I wouldn't hold the position that I hold now if I hadn't played football. So the injuries are uh, probably worth carrying. Tony, why are you wearing a Port Adelaide tie? <laughs> Maybe Fritzy will tell you later on. Because he's wearing a spare tie. <laughs> You two live together? <laughs> no, that goes back quite a way, actually. It's, uh, um, I don't know. Why do we do it, Eric? It's uh, a several years old story, that one. Uh, I think we were drinking after a grand final, which I think Port won. And Sturt weren't playing, and being a Sturt vice president, uh, I offered him my tie, and he offered me my Port Adelaide, this Port Adelaide tie, which I wear very proudly. My uncle was patron of Port Adelaide for a long, long time, unbeknown to a lot of people. And uh, one of the first league footballers I ever met was an old fellow called Foster Williams. He was under the hand of a, a masseur out on the road. What was his name, Foster? Charlie Vaughan. Charlie Vaughan. And I went in there one night as about a 12-year-old, and you were the first footballer I ever met and probably influenced me as much as anyone because you were a bit tough in your approach to getting fit. Um, 
So I've always had a sort of attachment to Port Adelaide. There is a statement down in the club rooms now which is attributed to me, which was said with my tongue in my cheek. And I don't believe it, uh, but uh, that Port Adelaide is... Uh, I pay some tribute to Port Adelaide, which I forget, but it was probably at least 50% wrong. But I said it in, in print at one stage, and uh, they put it up on their board. So I have a strong attachment to Port Adelaide. In fact, if Steve Trainer and Ron Elloway and those guys that I see regularly down there don't buy me a drink, I'm very upset. So I can say quite honestly, Foss was the most courageous player that I've ever seen, and that carries, I suppose, 30 years. Jack, um, I just ask you a question about Foss. Well, you've been coaching for a lot of years now in South Australia and Victoria. How has Foss Williams influenced your coaching uh, style? Oh, well, I would say that I'd be very similar to Foss. Um, you know, it's getting the ball and getting it on as long and as direct and as quick as you can. So, and he is courageous. I, I remember where um, someone said earlier about Foss putting Finalgan. Now, Finalgan is the hottest thing that you can put on your body, and to put it around his groin area was, was one of the most courageous things ever. But not, not the most, because when he made me do it, I thought that was more courageous. <laughs> <laughs> penetrine was Foss's go, where, where most people get off of marijuana, Foss used to drink penetrine. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I really, uh, I still call Foss coach, and uh, that's the respect I have for the man. And I know that uh, all the Sturt players look at Jack Odie and call him exactly the same. Jack, your greatest thrill from playing football? Uh, probably, I would say a few things. Your first game, your first grand final in 63, beating Victoria. John Tilbrook said tonight that, uh, in his opinion, they used to have fun playing football and it doesn't seem to be so much fun anymore. Is that a, is that a fair comment? I, I would say it's on your approach. No, I always, um, I, I thought Foss was fairly intense. I, I knew that I always was. Uh, the game to me had to be won and, and the opponent had to be beat. So, But now I, I would say on the training track, uh, yes, Foss had a good sense of humour and, and I have a good sense of humour. So, yeah, there is fun and you can enjoy it. But I don't think it's, it has to be intense all the time. It goes down here. Here's a chance now once again for Holmes. He can't pick it up. Hicks in there too. He can't get away with it. Miles goes through. Can't get away with it either. It's still in the centre patch. Trevor Clark gets his boot to it. Out towards the centre wing it comes. Big Dave Gill goes through there. Goes to the ground. Gets the ball away though to Kev Salmon. from the centre of the cricket pitch, drives Sturdy into attack for the first time, up towards Halbert Cooper from behind, can't pull it down, grabs it, clears out towards the wing, Clark and Dylan doing battle, comes down off hand, Holmes a chance, in comes Big Mouth and his kick, uh, Hill soccers it off the ground, up to Cale at the centre of the ground, his high up in the air, Clarkson running in for them, not comes down off hand, a chance for Darrell Hicks to put him into attack, he misses the ball with his kick, stock it off the ground to Halbert, Halbert into attack, but there's Trevor off, waiting in defence, the Rocket Gibraltar takes the easiest of Mark, gets the lead here from Cahill, but doesn't want it, as Trevorov settles Port down very early and drives up towards the centre of the ground, gets under it, but a good-looking kick, comes down off hands to Shearman, he can't grab it, in goes home, Shearman there as well, pushing the ball in front of him, picked up, kicks high up in the air, very nervous players here to start with, as the ball is fisted away from Kahl and will go out over the boundary line. And I couldn't understand Olsen there. He had a lead from Kahl, a good lead. He ignored it and kicked it straight back to where Shearman was. From the throw-in on the half-forward right flank, comes down quickly to Chessel. Chessel gets his boot to the ball. Third through into attack, the bounce favours Trevor Ops eventually. He traps it beautifully, puts them out of attack, up to the wing position, where through comes Phil Nelson. Drives at the ball, heavily met by Kahl. Picked up quickly by Tilbrook, mother there beautifully off Tilbrook's boot. Up towards Haslam, in goes Chessel to help. Stock it off the ground, Porter into attack as Freeman comes to meet the ball. Puts the ball onto his right foot, 
Crosser into attack down towards the full forward arrow and it goes. Off hand, Gasser, Pilgrim in there trying to pick the ball up, does so. Pulled off the ball, stuck it off the ground and first blood to Port Adelaide. Freeman looked good down here. He, 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 he got a very early side of that ball. He came out and met it promptly. And all the time in the world of turn and drove it right in. He read the ball a lot quicker than Jarrett. And whether these contact lenses are helping him, I don't know. But at this stage, he, he certainly read that ball early. Waiting on Bruce Jarrett. He's going out to the eastern side of the ground. He's got Chessel out there. Clarkson out there too. There goes his kick. Clarkson's home. No, it goes out of his hands. And here's a chance for Bruce Nyland. Over it comes once again. And Brendan Adcock, reliable backman for Sturt, falls to his knees, takes a nice mark, and he'll drive right down the eastern wing. There goes his kick. A good-looking kick. And it goes over the heads of players. Leading in the race of the ball is Holmes, but it's over the boundary line. And Clarkson's going to run in. So too there, going in as Big Bob Silk, number 13. 20 is Clarkson. There they go. Down it comes. Tail around the pack there. There's a chance for Haslam. Can he get the run of it? He can't. Slotters it off the ground. It goes right down here, but it's going out over the boundary line. And the score. Port Adelaide, one point. Sturt yet to open their account. And they've been playing just around about three minutes. A few minutes later, a free disturbs Trevor Clark. Tilbrook down there. He's done a finding. Nice mark taken by John Tilbrook. They're going to have to watch this boy, Port Adelaide, if they want to take this one out. He played very well last week. There goes his kick right over to the 10-yard square. It goes. The players fly. Nobody can just sight this ball. They lose sight of it. It's going right through. And I think it's rushed Freak. through. Free kick. Oh, the three. Free kick to Jones. Blair, uh, Bagshaw looks tired today. I don't know. He, he just doesn't seem to have his usual snap in himself. I don't know if it's... If he's just saving himself, but he doesn't look to have the usual spring that bags you have got. And uh, with he looks a little bit tired. Yeah, he not often see that. But he's he'll dropped down already, too. Third goal by Jones was their first. Port had only one point. However, soon after, Port scored through Potter. From up towards the wing position, and he finds Gill. Gill leading in front there of scores, plays on quickly to Kale, dropping down. He's created the loose man and puts her into attack. It's quickly claimed there by Nelson. Kale kicked towards Seven. Seven running back, but in comes Potter and takes a great mark great under mark. a lot of pressure. Where did he come from? Oh, he had had top then, very strong. He held his ground, and he took a great mark there under pressure. 30 yards out on a very slight angled putter. Boots it in towards goal for Port Adelaide. No worries. Right through the middle. And Port Adelaide retaliate with a goal through Jeffrey Potter. And now into the time on period and Sturt goal again. Then cleverly shoots it down here towards the full forward area. But for mine it's Sturt. Yes, here's a chance for Emmy Jones. pick up play 12 minutes into the second term, Sturt kicking to the scoreboard or the northern end. Clarkson gets a beautiful tap down to Sherman, Sherman gets it onto his left foot, drives up towards Joe, Joe goes him for it, takes a beauty, good mark, oh he threw him to it, he's hurt himself I think, I think. he's winning, just it I think, I think oh he's, he's rolling the ball here, he lobbed on the ball, a magnificent uh, effort by Jones there, he is 20 yards out, he's on a fairly acute angle, probably can't see much of the goals, not more than two or three feet, but he's he pretty there. accurate from this distance, and there's his drop punt. What's he done now? He's kicked it a beautiful goal to Malcolm Jones, and that's his third. Now late in the second quarter, and a throw-in on the eastern side of the ground. The throw-in, Hill and uh, Big Bob Phillips. Down it goes, Terry Short in there, Haslam in there too. Socket off the ground by Salmon. Jessel coming through now, breaks his way clear. Over towards Darrell Hicks. Hicks turns into trouble. Drops the ball. Here's Salmon. He goes to the ground too. Gets it out quickly there, but Potter uh, Taylor couldn't get it. Here's a chance for Nelson. Suck it off the ground by Potter. Haslam coming in there. Hicks in there. Nelson. Short. Everybody's having a bash at it. Oh, the only bloke that hasn't had a kick. Here's Johnny Kale now. Down it goes. But it's the ever reliable Brent Nadcock dropping back there. Nadcock dropped back nicely. Stemmed another drive by the Port Adelaide forward. Here he's going to come out to the grandstand wing. He's got Nyland out here with Hicks, and it's Nyland all the way. Nyland takes it, falls to the ground. Miles there, Hicks there. 
Bob Phillips just walking away. Bruce Nyland, 24 for Port Adelaide. Left foot kick, not a bad looking kick either. Here's a chance for Freeman, a beautiful lead, and it came off. Well, no, I don't know whether Eric's, in, Eric's getting a better Haslam's start. Haslam's going off by the looks of things. Haslam's going off. Ashley McKay coming off. Well, he doesn't appear to be anything wrong with him as Ashley McKay runs on there. And uh, Freeman has a shot, a goal, what a magnificent oh. kick. It's going high up in the air, it's a goal. 55 to 60 yards out for Freeman. And that was Freeman's third goal. Now back to umpire Cunningham at the centre bounce area. Tap down towards Nyland. Nyland breaks clear, gets it onto his left foot. Draws is beating in the race to the ball there with Erie. Erie ball gets a nice handball over to Gill, but Gill picks it high in the air and gives all third players a run at the ball as Clark moves back, called in by his teammates and takes the mark. Clark settles back to take the kick up along the flank with a punch it drives towards the wing position Wilbrook getting underneath it Spears there first but neither can get to the ball before it goes out over the boundary line for a throw in on the centre wing on the far side of the ground Sambo Salmon number 27 doing battle in ruck now with uh, big Malcolm Hill in comes Wolf as well gets the tap down over towards Clark Rigney chips in gets there onto his left foot gets it up towards centre half forward uh, Tilbrook doing battle there takes him out play on gets the handball away but it's not a good one Fist it away again. This is to help with the run at the ball. He's well clear of Cooper. Pick it up if he can. He does. Drive third into attack with a high punch kick. Getting up towards Clayton. Jones flies high. Comes down off hand. The through comes out away. Clearing strongly for Port Adelaide. Drive towards the boundary line and kicks it straight out of the And I know that's Port have shifted Freeman out the centre half forward and they've dropped trainer in, into full forward. Uh, this, is the, this is the boy I think they're looking for a lift from in Freeman. He's uh, He's the boy that Foss has got his hopes pinioned across that half forward line. Hill in there making front position this time. He couldn't get it. Spears gets his kick down there. Johnny Cale going after the ball. He's making a lot of paces. Still in play. He's got it. No, the boundary umpire says you're too late, brother. It went over the boundary line. There's players down on the ground everywhere as we're waiting for this ball to be retrieved. The score, 7 goals, 7, 49, Sturt. 5 goals, 2, 32, Port Adelaide. A margin of 17 points to the third team at this stage, and they've been playing four minutes into the time on period. Here's Hill going in once again. Bob Phillips coming in too. Hill gets the knock again, and it goes right towards the boundary line. Clark retrieves it before it goes over. Gets it away to Rickney. Back to Clark again. And here's a beautiful one over towards Philbrook. And by Clark by Philbrook. There's what he did. And pulled it in. Now, he's a big fellow, this Philbrook. There goes his kick. Looking for Jones again, but Jones can't get there on this occasion. Talbot's in there. He beats, but it's a wild kick and it's out of bounds. It's offline. And time is fast running out in this particular quarter. It must be almost half time. 7-7 seven, seven, Sturt. 5-2 Port Adelaide from the throw-in in the Sturt full forward right pocket. Salmon and Ruck makes front position, gets the tap down to Potter. Potter, who's been strangely quiet today, gets the kick up to the half-back flank, where Spears, well in advance of Tilbrook, who looks a bit disheveled at this stage, uh, Spears takes the mark. Spears clears towards the centre wing position. Jessel from behind. Oh, a beautiful mark pulled down there by Gill. He loses it, though. Flips over now, all over the next by Jessel, but Gill plays on. Up towards full forward it goes. The centre half forward it goes, where Freeman leads in the race of the ball. Three comes Bagshaw. Very cool in defence. Spears with a beautiful pass. Up to Dunn. Dunn plays on. Get the handball over to Hicks. Dunn created the loose man. Dunn doesn't Albert. know where to go. Gets Albert. it to Halbert on the lead. And there it is. Oh, Halbert the Oh, Judge Nelson from the third to clear, but Halbert gets himself back in will. Gets the kick away up towards goal. It's good run through. Reverob's on the last line of defence. Clears for Port Adelaide. Sturt 7-7 led Port Adelaide 5-2 at half time and we now see Port Adelaide into attack early in the third quarter. Handball away but Cale uh, intercepts, goes for a short pass, Freeman again! Fully played in by Sturt. Ah, oh, ridiculous. Fully. This is the type of stuff that's got them in trouble in the second semi in and you would have thought they would have learnt their lesson. That, that play there from Bagshaw was ridiculous play. Freeman. Tucks off the hand, up towards two fours. Ryan drops it, Potter snaps from goal. Got him, there it is. Oh. Off the hand. No, it's a goal. It's a goal. Oh, it's a goal. No worries. It's a goal for Potter. Jeffrey Potter kicks his second goal. At this stage, Port Adelaide 6-3, Sturt 7-8.
Oh, but anyhow, down it goes towards center half forward. Oh, what a good player this fellow is. He doesn't waste any tail, and it's tail again. Tail coming into again. Down it goes to Dennis Erie. Port breaking away, and they can't let them do this, sir. There goes his kick. It's right over here. There's Freeman. He's flying. Oh, yeah, Adcock. Good mark, Adcock. Adcock flew high. His gentle out here wide. Not a good kick this time. And it's oh. Erie again. Dennis Erie, he's not going to waste any kicks. He's going to put this right deep down. He's got big Steve Trainer there. Oh, and a shock and it didn't come off. Oh, here's a chance though once again. Handball on it goes to Kale. Kale drives down here. Oh, and Bagshaw. Bagshaw only had four kicks in the first half. He had one just now, and this is his sixth kick for the whole match. Terry Short gathers the ball in. Down it goes right along the far side of the ground, but it's out of bounds. The score, seven goals, eight, 50 points, third, 6 3, 39, Port Adelaide. An interesting port here. I see that Port have finally got Airy over on uh, Hicks. They were trying to change their wings early in the, in the, the third quarter. Uh, they've lined up that way. Hoop comes in over the top, gets the tap away. It comes out quickly to Clark. Clark going the wrong way, but Short chips in. Gets the kick up towards the centre of the ground, where Holmes coming through nicely. Oh, heavily met with what I thought was a legitimate bump, but it's a... Uh, oh, never. Not in a hundred years. That's why Cunningham has played it, so that's two of you that agree. Uh, Holmes from the uh, centre wing position up towards the centre of the ground. Fisted away, a chance now for Spencer. He gets pushed off the ball beautifully. A chance now for Rigney to clear. Gets the handball over to Adcock. It's gone astray. In there's Pilgrim. Bagshaw tries to break his way through. He's oh, got oh, holding the ball. And this is this boy's big filing. A little bit uh, a little bit hard there, Ian. Yeah, he, he was tripped as he, as he took possession. And, uh, but uh, this, is, this is Paul's one failing. As he, he thinks he's got plenty of time. Ashley McKay it is to take the free Left kick. Left quarter two. 25 yards out. Lines up from goal. It doesn't look a good looking point. Dragged it offline. One point only. And Port Adelaide making a very determined bid to snatch back this lead that Sturt had set up during the first half. I can imagine what Foster Williams would have said to them during the half-time interval. The blizzard of the paint, I think, Blair. Uh, incidentally, Sports are kicking with they the breeze in they're, this they're, quarter. They've got to set up an advantage here. Over towards the half-back, Clark it goes, and Clarkson comes through and takes the easiest of marks. Clarkson from the half-back left flank drives up towards the centre of the ground. Chairman and Taylor wait for the ball. Yeah, Chairman man. over the top, takes a very strong mark. Dale, who showed signs of getting on top there for a while, but Chairman has come back strongly now. And after having kicked, had 10 kicks in the first quarter, John Cale, he was subdued somewhat in the second quarter and only had four. Chairman kicked up towards the half-forward line. Holmes playing a lot better now. Drives Ford out of attack, out of defence, up towards Salmon. Salmon there takes the mark, and Ford Adelaide are in attack. Oh, oh, oh. Knocking handball there by Salmon. Went astray as Cale made the break, but through comes Spears. Gets it up towards Salmon again. In there is uh, uh, Ford. Nelson there forcing the ball in front of him. Hale running wide into tack, drives it towards goal. This is going to be a goal! A magnificent play by John Hale. And this player is lifting Sports off his own boot and lifted them to a magnificent goal. And Sports now move into seventh, move on to seven goals for only trailing Sturt by four points. A few minutes later, Sturt came right back into things. Chairman, he gets it out to Dunn. Dunn drives on with his left foot up to the wing position, up towards Halbert in there is Holmes now. He's on top of Miles at this stage, tries to get his right foot at the ball, can't do so. Miles battling hard with a ball in front of him, picks it up, gets a long hand ball over to Clark. Clark ball breaks his way clear, skirts her into attack again now with a long kick up towards Severovs. He can't get it, Rickney into the open goal, if he can pick it up it's in. Oh, he's got a putt, he's got to get a free. It's a free to Roger Rickney right in the 10 yard area and he could not possibly miss from this. Oh, that was a beautiful kick from Clark. Gave Roger Rigney the run of the ball. But he was that upon there by the Port Adelaide players. He's being taken right around. You can see Trevor Ob standing his mark. But Roger Rigney from three yards out, and boy, the Ports need this. He missed it. missed it. It's a shocker. Off the side of his boot, he's in a lot of trouble. Holding his back there. He oh, was that was a terrible upon. kick. But uh, he should never have missed from that one. And Port Adelaide uh, breathe again. Beautiful sunshine. Time fast running out in the third term. And Sturt looking to be just a little bit the better at the stage. 
There goes the kick. Kale and Sherman in there. Kale made front position. Tilbrook goes through. He goes to the ground heavily. Play it on, says the umpire. Guns there. Rigney's there. Heathrow throws the ball away. The umpire is there. Oh, there were about four marks there that he didn't see, but he saw the one with Faber's turn. That's the main thing. He's got a difficult angle here, Blair. I don't think he can kick the goal from here. He'll never make the distance. He'll get the distance, but I think the screw will take the ball away. Oh, he's sick. Up towards the oh, no! Oh, right out in front. What a lucky one. Big boy's having a row today. That's the first easy one, I'd say. He's got a hit. He's fought for his others, but there again, he does the... He's, oh, I won't say he does the mystic, but he read the mystic earlier than anybody else. And he threw himself there to take a nice mark in front of goal. Lines it up there. Great through the middle. No worries at all. That's his sixth goal. Three quarter time scores were Sturt 9-12, Port Adelaide 7-7, and now into the last quarter. Desperate defence by Port kicking short. out a short pass across the Sherman who's come off. He's 20 yards closer to goal, and Sherman is 55 yards out right in front. And you can see Sherman now taking in a deep breath there. He's got it in his mind. Can I kick this one for Sturt? If I can, this could be the grand final. Lines up the kick. A beautiful drop kick right up towards goal. Oh, and a magnificent kick from Sherman. And the Sturt runners on the field. I would say he's setting out his congratulations from Jack Odie, but it's not over yet. Now, several minutes later, back at the centre bounce area. Salmon's in there. So too is Hill. Spencer in there. Dunn gets it, gets his boot to it. Out it comes here towards Miles. Miles turns, he's on his own. Sinks the boot once again. Down here towards Emmy Jones, but it's Trevor Obbs. Obbs takes it. No, no worries. No, 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 no. You're a good guy. <laughs> Trevor Obbs goes back. He's played a great game of defence today for Port. There goes the kick right Bang down up. here. Malcolm Hill, Bagshaw oh. in there. Hill, yes, Hill all the way. What a good player oh. he's been for Sturt. What a valuable player he's been over the finals. This fella last year in the finals. This boy's taking about seven marks today. Look at the pass. Oh. oh, what a magnificent pass there. Uh, Malcolm Hill is probably the greatest acquisition Sturt have got all year, that's for sure. As Malcolm Hill led beautifully, got the pass. And he's 45 yards out. He's right in front. He can kick this. He's not too he's far. He's lining up with a drop punt. He'll be lucky to make the distance. He's there it is. He's got... What is it? It's right through the middle. And there it is. It's his seventh goal. Now watch this pass from Tilbrook to Clarkson. Shows a ton of dash. Drives in towards goal. Clarkson! And here it is. This is it. This is the coup de grace. And Clarkson has taken the mark. 12 yards out. Right in front. And if ever a side has got a grand final one, it is set for the 1966 Premiership. And brilliant play by Tilbrook. Then he raced in, hit the ball on from the from the uh, Port Adelaide defenders. Oh, and Gatlin drove in a magnificent pass to Clark, pass to Clarkson. That is Clarkson's second goal to score. Sturt, 13 goals, 13 put, seven goals, eight. And the game is almost over. As there's only seven minutes of actual time playing, plus time off. Back at the centre bounce, Spencer gets the tap down over towards Spears. He kicks it the wrong way. Miles is under the ball, fisted away from him. Given Nyland the run of the ball, he picks it up, bolts beautifully around Miles, drives him with an underground punch, gives Gill the run of the ball quickly over to Tail. Tail drives it in towards goal, but it's all third back there as Bagshaw now in defence. And this player would be. Oh, he, he would have taken, taken, high. Yeah, he would have taken eight marks in this last quarter. Have done out here loose on this side. Checking on the statistics, I believe uh, Bagshaw only had four kicks to half time. Boy, do you reckon he's come into it in his last oh, quarter? Over towards the half-back flank it goes. Down off hands. In there is Chessel. Turns out of the double beautifully. The long hand ball over to Clark. Clark drives along the wing. Driving for the boundary line. Up there is Silver. Oh. A magnificent mark. Plays on quickly, showing magnificent strength. Over towards Miles. Miles getting out of the ball. Flies high. Can't hold it. Holmes there. Clears, but it's not a good kick. A chance now for Jones. Jones, if he can get there. Holmes is a beaten player. It's Jones pushes the ball out in front of him. Gets the handball out to Miles. Clarkson comes in for the Shepherd. Miles there. Drives in towards goal. But it's oh. offline for one point only. Gee, they're tired, these Port boys. You've only got to have a look at them. Tired. Both sides have done their very best for their jumpers today but it looks like a double blue victory as the players have got the added incentive now. They're leading by six, seven goals, and they have got the incentive. Port Adelaide 
realising that they've got the job in front of them, would have to kick seven goals in six minutes, and I don't think they can do it. Uh, the 19-minute mark, and there's the kick from Clayton. High out it goes, and here's the chance once again for Tilbrook. Right back, but Clayton flies in there, but it's one point only. Shortly after, Jones kicked his eighth goal, and now we see Sturt attacking again in the closing minutes. He can't do anything with it. Here's a chance now once again for Nylon to break it away. Down the grandstand wing it goes, but it's going out over the boundary line. Ah, that's no. a stupid three. That's, that's, that's a bad. by Ashley McKay. Three to be taken by Port Adelaide, Ashley McKay. Further afield it goes. Big Bob Philp there. Here's a chance to. Here's a chance now, but oh, Colin Moore snaps, but it goes out of bounds. You've been and on the way right. Oh, it'll be Get the red in. paint out if you're out that way. They're going to paint it red for sure. And you can't blame them. It's their first premiership, I think, since 1940. And no doubt Jack Odie would be the happiest man in Australia, if not the happiest man in the world and in outer space, too. I take that into uh, it. Blair, if I was Jack Odie, I'd, I'd pay a little uh, tribute to uh, Murphy here. I'd bring him on and let this boy taste the blood here because here's a boy that's given cert valuable service over the years and I'd bring him on just to let him taste the blood of this win. There's Spencer, he can't pick it up. Chessel in there. Spencer's grabbed, throws it almost. Here's the chance once again for Spears. Oh, too high. He's got to get a free. He does so. Another free going to Port Adelaide. And uh, Spears will drive right down towards centre half forward. But they might as well give it away because it's all over. They're at the, uh, just checking on the clock, they're at the 22 minute mark now. Here's a chance once again, Clark turns, gets it onto his right foot, kicks into the man though. Here's Paul Bankshaw, he can't get it, Clark gets it once again, there goes his kick, right out towards Bankshaw, it's right out on the boundary line, players battling there, nobody can pick it up. And I think the umpire will come in and bounce this one eventually. <laughs> Soon after this bounce, Sturt broke away once again and John Halbert goes. Now back to the centre. Today, it's the double blues all the way. And they're at the 29-minute mark. It's just a formality now. Bob Philp gets a mighty knock, but it's Terry Short comes in. Gets his left foot to it, out towards Miles on oh, the grandstand the wing. wing. Here's Hicks. a chance for Hicks. He's doing battle in there. Gathers it in quickly. Down it goes, but it's out over the boundary line again. From the throw-in, Port Adelaide went into attack once again with time running out. They're not giving up. They know it's hopeless, but they're not giving up. There's Ashley Mackay. Turns cleverly. Gets onto his left foot, shoots it down, and there's a chance for a goal! And they've got it! Not that it's much good to them, but they've got it. They need about ten more of them. Yes, it's all over, but it's, uh, they're not giving up, and they've been playing five and a half minutes of time on now, and the time is two minutes to five on the scoreboard. It can't be much longer, I'm sure. Well, it certainly hasn't been magpie day here today. Their seconds were hopelessly outclassed by Norwood. And now Sturt have done the same thing. And I might, add, I might add here, this is the fourth side this year that won the semi-final, the second semi-final to be defeated in the grand final. Just goes to show you they need this game in these between times. I reckon they do it anyway. Yeah. From the kickoff, it's uh, Hicks puts them into attack again, but Ellaway comes out for the ball, decides to go for a run, drives the ball right up towards the half forward line, getting Nelson. underneath it is Nilsson over the top, can't pull it down at all. But uh, oh, Spencer claims the mark, wasn't paid it, stuck it off the ground, and it comes out to short. Short a short pass up towards Rigney. Rigney breaks his way clear, gets a short one up looking for Miles, and it's back in. Grand final has gone to the double blues. The final scores again. Sturt 16-16 defeated Port Adelaide 8 goals 8 in the 1966 Grand Final. Yeah, what a proud man he must be. It's very good here to see the Port side waiting on the ground to see Sturt accept the, accept the trophy. Blair, I would like to place on record my congratulations to Jack Odie and to the Sturt players for the magnificent effort in winning this 1966 Grand Final. There is it is, John Halbert holding up the big trophy. He's waited a long time for that. And so has Jack Odie. He's coached many premiers or many sides that have gone down in the last few kicks of these grand finals. But today he's right on top. 
and uh, well done Jack you've done a great job with third and my congratulations to you also to Foster Williams uh, Foster's always around the pace there he is now moving over to congratulate Jack Odie you can't see him in your screen there now but congratulations to Foster Williams and Port Adelaide for the way they played today 